Hello and welcome to today's webinar, Microfilm Digitization Process. I'm Will, I'm from BMI, and we're going to be going over our uh, microfilm scanning process today and what we do when you work with us to digitize your records. So let's get right into it. And of course, Happy New Year. Uh, it is the third, so thank you for joining. One of the first things you do in 2024, we appreciate it. I hope you get some information from this that gets your year started right as you look into microfilm digitization. So a couple, uh, actually, sorry, about purpose first before we get into the housekeeping. So the purpose of today's webinar is, of course, to illustrate the steps in a microfilm scanning project. These are our steps. We can't speak for the exact way or methods that other companies do their work, but this is the kind of nutshell of how BMI would scan your microfilm records if you decide to work with us. We're going to address any concerns you may have about the scanning process. And then, of course, you want to get you excited about scanning your film as we get into the new year. Maybe budgeting's coming up or you've been holding off on a project till a calendar year rolled around. Hope that this helps you get a better feeling about it and get excited to scan your film. So the nuts and bolts, uh, just to make sure everything's working properly. Could you please raise your, using the uh, the Zoom little toolbar, could you raise your hand if you can hear me? All right, perfect. I see a couple of hands go up. And how about if you can see my screen, which should say nuts and bolts, and also a little, video, uh, a little side video of me. Okay, perfect. I also see a couple of hands there. So I know it's working, at least for some people, which means it's working for everybody. All right, you are muted and not on video, so please use the QA tool that's uh, included with Zoom. And as you go along, of course, ask questions. And if I see there's a question asked, I'll try to answer it as it comes up. But if not, there's a little bit of time at the end so I can answer it then. But go ahead and ask them along the way. All right, so jumping right into it, microfilm digitization is basically taking your hard copy film, what you see over here, zapping into a digital format and getting what you see over here. Now, this is a particular type of digitization that you're seeing. It's an application that we have that we'll talk about towards the end, but these are digital images that can then be turned into PDFs, TIFFs, JPEGs, whatever you need. You're taking that analog copy, crossing the river and becoming or getting a digital version of those records. So that's the whole point of all of this. And there are two methods, well, not to find more than two, but the, the main two that we'd be talking about are what we'd say, kind of do it yourself or outsourcing and do it yourself. This is a scan pro uh, microfilm scanner. We used to actually sell scan pros until about 2019. So we know they're good machines. And they're what you think of when you're thinking of desktop scanning or what you see like libraries, building departments or personal researchers, maybe get some of these. They do have some auto scanning, but it's what you'd probably get if you're doing your own scanning because the machines that we use in other companies like us use these machines, very expensive. They're made for more high quantity production level projects, whereas this is more likely to be for something for smaller projects, maybe up to a hundred, couple hundred rolls or something that's not really uh, time sensitive. You're not rushing to get something done. You have the time to do it. But these are the two main methods is you do it yourself or you have a company like us do it for you. And we're gonna be focusing of course on us doing it for you and what we do to get that accomplished. So before we go into each individual step, the 10 steps of the BMI scanning process are, of course, receive your microphone. We have to have it to actually do the work. We're going to tag your transportation containers, keep them in secure storage. We'll create a job order for your specific project. We, get a, we have to photograph the film labels. We tag them with UID or unique identifier barcodes. Prep the film, scan it do some post-scan image processing, and then indexing. We'll go through each of those in turn. So transportation, basically receiving your microfilm, we have to get it first. And that can be done through a variety of methods. You could you know, freight it, you could ship it, you know, normal UPS, FedEx, something like that. Uh, well, this is FedEx an, an image of, but you might get a freight company or uh, what's it called, LTL to come pick it up and carry like on an, uh, maybe a specialized truck just for your project. Some of our clients have done that and they have, maybe multiple pallets of film, and they want only their film on a transportation container, they can hire a company to do that. If you're more local, we may have one of our drivers go to pick up your film. This is Bernard, one of our drivers in our unmarked vans that can be, or that are locked when we're carrying custom material. If you're in the California or sort of Western region, 
and it makes sense, then we could pick it up. But a lot of times our customers will just send them to us by, again, UPS, FedEx. We do have special containers to assist with that. Uh, they're Pelican cases, which are used in the military uh, that keep things dry, free of chemicals. They can put some padding in it so it keeps from bouncing around. And we have locks on those. So if you have sensitive material, it doesn't remove the issue of, well, what happens if my film gets lost after UPS picks it up or the truck spontaneously combusts with your records in it? That's something that no one can prepare for. But these lockable containers can mitigate any tampering or any potential, you know, someone trying to just fool around with your your records or get into them. It at least mitigates uh, those issues and we can provide those for your project. Typically, those are used for sensitive records, uh, not necessarily non-sensitive or public records, but it's up to our clients. Once we receive your film, they're not going to be sent as individual rolls, of course. They're going to be sent in some sort of package like a banker's box or something. So what we're going to do is actually tag the, the boxes or containers that they come in. And this is an example of one of our tags. So it says when we received it, the project city of, I uh, redacted that. So uh, the client's name, the job number, that's internal for us to track it, and then the box number, and again, a barcode. Those barcodes are used when we move the uh, the boxes or containers from room to room or who uh, checks them out to actually get the film out of there for whichever step in the process we're on. And that's put into our MTS, which is Material Tracking System, within our Unity application. And Unity is our homegrown internal system that our software team built for projects to basically track projects, track billing, and everything that goes around projects throughout the entire process. So it's tracked from the moment we get it to when the project's complete. Then secure storage. So we've received your film. We've tagged it. We know it's in the building. We see who's, who's brought it in. And let's say we're not working on it right away. Then we'll put it into secure storage where we have a couple different areas that this could be in. An example, I'm not showing you inside the room, but there's a restricted storage room. But you can see here that there is a basically a badge uh, reader. So you can only go into that room if you've been designated as an individual or employee of the company that should be able to get into that room. Typically restricted storage is for uh, higher level sensitivity materials, but it's also used for some projects where we just wanna keep them in there when they're not being utilized. We also have an onsite vault at our Sunnyvale headquarters. So we have the the main door and then what we call the day gate, also locked, only certain individuals can get in there. And I'm not going into the room with the, the picture, but you can see that once you're in, we have racks, keep things off the floor. It's temperature controlled, humidity controlled. So we, most of the time with almost, almost every film project, we keep in this room anyway because of the temperature and humidity control so that the records are not exposed to elements they don't need to be. Now, security in general at the company is very high on our, on our list of things that we're one proud of and that we take very seriously. But the company itself, the, uh, the building, at least the you know, headquarters is the one I'm specifically talking about where all film and fish and aftercards are scanned. It's kind of like an onion where you have the outer layer and you keep stripping away uh, uh, layers of that onion until you get to the center. So you can imagine the building itself is the outer layer of the onion. And to get into the building, you have to have an ID badge and actually, you actually have to have an ID badge. So, you know, you're an employee of the company. So you'd scan uh, on any of the external doors, that thing to get in. But there's also a pin code to get into the building. So even if I lost this and someone tried to get in, they wouldn't know my pin code. Or if they knew my pin code, they'd have to have this too. So that's just to get into the building. And then once you're inside, any non-BMI employee would go to the lobby area in the front of the, of the building and there are more of these doors with these badge uh, entrances that they can't get past those doors unless they have a badge or they're escorted. So we already segregate the production area from the sales, admin area, finance area in the front of the office so that visitors can come in, be in the lobby, conference room, and so forth, but they can't get into the production area unless they're escorted. Then you're in the production area where the scanning's done, where materials are, where the warehouse is. And there are individual rooms like that restricted storage room, like uh, uh, there's our film scanning room, can also be locked down so only certain individuals can get in with those badges. So security around your records is paramount, and we have numerous ways to protect it, and those are just some physical ways that your film is protected. 
So we have your film. We, of course, have con uh, the contract in place, the scope of work. Now there's the handoff between sales and our production team and where they're going to create the job order to start what we call our milestone one proof of concept process. Now, creating that job order again in that unity system, except this is now the portion called SOP, scope of project. This is an actual uh, work order. I created it. It was a small microfiche scanning job. But you can see there are various service lines that as the salesperson, I will be translating my contract, my scope work into something the production team can use because sales and production and operations, languages are a little bit, you know, words are different, languages are different. And then sets of you know, sales language versus production. So creating this singular method of everyone understanding the same thing is critical to our projects. So I create this and say, you know, there's a, our, the projects, the opportunities get reviewed by a team. So that has to be approved. There's a security classification level for this project, which this was level two. Then there's the information about who's going to review the milestone. Will it be me? Will it be sent directly to my client? How we're going to scan the microfiche? How we're going to screen uh, the film and fiche? Uh, what types they are? The pricing? What we're going to do with the images once they're actually converted? Are we going to give them PDFs, TIFFs? Is it going to be our digital real application? Delivery, indexing, everything that the production team is going to do will be translated into line by line items in unity within SOP. So once the team has that, they can create the milestone process flow, which is basically creating the entire workflow of our client's individual unique project based on that scope of work. So in this case, this was a, this is an actual microfilm scanning project process flow, although we've changed the name of the, the client. So this is not a real company, but those steps are real. And these items, these bars on here indicate how many roles like this one, 800 roles was in the configure role XML stage. So this is actually tracking roles throughout the entire process. Now we build this process flow during the milestone one to test a small batch of your records and make sure our process flow works make sure we actually received what you said we'd receive. And it's all kind of, it's all what we expected. So we can run some roles. Let's say it's a 500 role project. We might do five or 10 roles, run it through that M1 and then work with you to get that approved to make sure that you say, yes, this is what I was expecting or no, that's actually not correct. We need to tweak this here or there, whatever it is. But once we get that proof of concept done, we wait for your formal approval before we move forward the rest of the project, because we don't want to have to finish a project, deliver everything at once. You say, that's not what I expected. That would be Worst case scenario. So we get that approval process done early before we move forward with the bulk of the project. And then that process flow is used for the remainder of the project and any tweaks or changes we made along the way. So these these steps in here are kind of, you know, the milestone is the, really the, the beginning of the main project, of course. The next couple steps like photographing the film label, scanning, et cetera, et cetera. Those are actually done for that small batch before the milestone. But I just put the milestone ahead in these steps here because that's kind of the small step before the main you know the remaining 490 rolls are done if we were using that 500 roll example but what we're going to do is photograph the film label so this is a camera setup here's a roll here's some more rolls we're going to photograph each side of that roll label if there's information on it because sometimes you might have information just on one side it might be on two three four maybe every side we're going to capture those with a photograph so we can provide those in your digital uh, when we deliver the digital images. It's nice to see what the original writing on the microfilm or the roll label said. So you can always go back to that. Here's an example of some library microfilm or a newspaper microfilm, I mean. And this is just one side. I'm sure the larger side had something as well, but it's just a photograph of that label. We're going to tag those films with additional UID, those UID there are some unique identifying barcodes. So the containers like the banker's boxes that hold the film and receive it, those will have tags, but so will the individual rolls of film so that we can actually track every single roll through the entire process. So this is literally 800 rolls. Our production team, our software uh, and software folks can go and say, roll number one, two, three, four, five, six is in this step. Every single roll, we know where it is in that process. 
So once the photographs are done, we have the labels on them. We go to microphone prep. Sorry, these are a little blurry because I pulled it from one of our videos. But this is one of our operators doing some microphone prep, basically putting it on those spool rollers. And they take it, put it on one side, spool it, and it rolls up on another one. And they're checking for any breaks, tears, anything that needs to be fixed. Just a general quick look to make sure that film is okay to go through a scanner. Basically just making sure that it's not going to get torn up. There's not an issue with it before we start scanning. What we're also going to do during prep is take density checks. So this is a densitometer, and this looks like some 16 millimeter film here. And we take three density checks per roll, one at the beginning of a roll, one at the middle, and one at the end. So they press that little button there. A, a, density, a density reading comes up. We take the average of those three readings, beginning, middle, end, and that average becomes the density setting when we calibrate that roll to go on a scanner. The reason the density is important because it depends on the light settings and how that film was originally created so that the scanner gets the best, the optimal setting for that individual roll. And here's some density, uh, uh, density readings on a 35 millimeter roll film. And it's important to know with microfilm that those the average density is going to give you the average optimal image. We're not individually optimizing images and going through every, like on a 35 millimeter roll, there might be, let's say five, 600 frames. We're not going through and optimizing each individual image. We're taking that average density reading and creating the optimal setting for that roll as a whole. The reason that is important because the density and the, de the density across one roll of film can change. So you may have some images that are a little lighter, some that are a little darker, but that's because of how the film was originally photographed or created. Different light settings could have been used on the same roll. A different operator could have come in and done something a little differently than the person on the shift before them. So we're capturing that optimal average for the entire roll because we're doing these at scale. We're not individually optimizing every image. So of course you get the bar, you get the photographs, the barcodes, the prep, everything's ready to go. Film looks good. We have the density rings. Now we're going to actually put it on the scanner and get it scanned. And what we're going to do is the, the calibrations I was talking about earlier, when we do the prep to so those calibrations are ready, those tie back to that barcode because as we take that individual roll, let's say it's a project of again 500 rolls, we have multiple scanners. What our scanning operator will do is actually wand that barcode that allows our internal system, our Unity system to say, oh, this is you know just a wand of a barcode. This is roll one, two, three, four, five, six. That scanner will know which project it's tied to, which client it's tied to, and the settings needed for that roll based on those density settings because everything is tied to that barcode. As the roll goes through each of those steps, the barcode is wanded. And it knows, okay, this information is tied to this role. So when it gets to the next step, barcoded, wanded, okay, I know that I have this density reading. So I need to do these settings or I need to do this or it's for this project or it's going to go here in the next step. So that barcode ties everything together so that our operators don't have to individually or manually track them. They can just wand the barcode and then move forward with, in this case, putting it on the scanner. It's sort of augment, it's not you know, automation completely, but it's helping them be more effective, more productive, not to do many manual steps. It reduces the amount of memory that someone has to, or reduces the amount of information that someone has to remember to do around this, oh, I'm gonna wand the barcode, scanner's ready to go, put it on there and start scanning. And there's another scanner, close up of the film roll put on there and it goes through various items, goes through the, the photographic capture. And then those images are put into our uh, back-end system for what's next, post-scan image processing. So this is an actual image from our application Digital Reel. So in most instances, or in all instances, we're going to capture strips, the actual film image, and then depending on what you're going to do for your specific project after it's scanned, we'll do some post-scan image processing, cropping, etc. But in this case, this is an actual image, which if I was in the application, I could click on the images, look at them, zoom it in, zoom out, et cetera, et cetera. But in this case, I want to show you just from here what happens. We have these strips. Let's say you wanted to get something like PDFs. Okay, well, we can't, we're not just going to give you these strips and say, here you go. 
we're going to give you the individual images once they've been what we call framed or cropped. So if it starts like this, framing would be basically removing anything around that image and just giving you the, Im the, the, the file itself, the document itself, not the, the noise around it. This may be done programmatically, like these are what are called blips. So we may do framing based on blip location. We may just do it based on uh, the differences between the edges here and the, the, the outside. So that difference between the black and the white pixels, there are multiple ways to do it programmatically or maybe done manually. Typically manual framing is needed when, let's say the, uh, the, the um, contrast is not very good. So maybe it's just hard for a computer program to see that there is an actual delineation of an image there. It's, these aren't images that, I mean, these are clearly nice images, but you can imagine if this was a very, very dark image just because when it was captured and it was hard to tell where the image ends or where it begins, this may be cut off. Maybe the maybe only captures half of the image or it captures too much. Those may need manual framing where we have an actual operator go in and draw that frame around that image so that it cleans it up a bit. But most of the time, programmatic framing can work pretty well. So from this, you have this image, you frame it, and then you get the actual image like that. So you might get PDFs, you might tips, whatever it is, multi-page, single page, however you do it. But that's one piece of post-scan image processing is framing and cropping the images. Another piece would be OCR. So optical character recognition, allowing you to be able to search uh, the records, the images for keywords, phrases, numbers, things of that sort. So in this case, it's just showing that that word is highlighted because there was a search, that word's highlighted, and it took took you to this image. So that's a second piece of post-scan image processing. And third piece, uh, depending on what level of QA, quality assurance, or quality checking you want, there could be additional quality assurance. So we have our own standard QA, but some clients may want uh, additional, additional quality checking or certain types of quality checking like... Uh, there's something called AQL is a method of quality checking that's based on lots and how many, um, it's like lot sizes, the percentage of images that can be errors or missed, things of that sort. So if you want additional QA, that would be part of the post-scan image processing. Then you get to indexing, which is basically organizing the digital files so you can, of course, find them later and use them effectively. And with microfilm specifically, there are a couple main or common methods. The most common is roll level. So that, I like to think of the building block approach. You're replicating what you have now. You can always make it more fancy, make it more complicated, get more granular. But roll level is replicating what you do now with your microfilm. So in this case, if I was looking for a register Pajaronian, and I knew it was from Watsonville, I have these rolls. And I was looking for something in early February of 1968. I'd go to the cabinet, look on this. There's the roll. Put the roll and start scrolling along. In a digital format, of course, that's much faster. You don't have to go to a cabinet to find a physical roll. Then walk back to a desk, put it on a machine, start scrolling around, then goofing around the, the scanner itself, and go put it back. It's all digital. But this roll level name would be something like maybe just says what, register Pajaronian. Watsonville, January two through uh, January through February 29, 1968. So just the key information, and you're in an application. Oh, that's it. Click, and then you go through the individual images to where you want to find it. You'll know that if I'm looking for early February, it's probably in the middle of the roll somewhere. You kind of get to the middle of the roll, then poke around. That's a lot faster than the physical film, and you have the digital images you can, you know, export or maybe enhance or use text search on. So roll level. It replicates how you find it now. So it's very familiar to people that were used to the film or just know it's somewhere in here. It's digital. I can find it quickly. File level. In the same, um, using the, the newspaper film as the example, would be, let's say, issue. It would be like issue date indexing. That's what we would call file level for newspapers because there's, you know, August 1st, 1975. If that's an issue and it's a 20-page paper, that's easy enough. Okay, there's one file, there's one issue. We'll name it by 
that first page and that date. And then the next one will be August 2nd, then August 3rd, August 4th, et cetera. So with newspapers, that's how we typically do it. If you have uh, something like student records, it might be by the student name. Maybe it's a three, five, 10 page document, but there's maybe a folder, like personnel records, a folder with someone's name on it. Okay, that's the file, we'll capture that. Now it's more granular, it's a little more complex depending on how they're organized, the ease of finding those uh, key delineators. Like, is there a folder that's very clear? Oh, there's a folder that has a student's name on it. I know that is where this file starts. And then the next folder is the next student. The next folder is the next student. If it's easy, it may not be too much more expensive to actually do that compared to role level. If it's very difficult to find that, or there are many, many instances in index points, it could get complex and expensive fast because you may have multiple students on a page or maybe a, a file breaks in the middle of a page. That's much harder to find than something like a lab notebook with a, or a, like a, a flasher indicating it's a new lab notebook or a large gap of um, just blank film, no images between, like, let me go back to this. You can imagine if like that, if that's a flash sheet, okay, that's quite different from this and it's eye readable. Or let's say this was the last image, this was gone, this was gone, this was gone. And then there was another image. It's a clear chunk where, oh, that file ends, that one begins. So the eye readable, clear identifiers of new files will make it easier than having every page and having to look around in each page. Then you have image level indexing, which you're not just looking for a file like a newspaper page. Maybe you want individual pages, every single page index, or you have to look at every page because it may or may not have a file or a, excuse me, an index point. So in this case, original records here, maybe we're capturing this and this because we want to get both stamps and identify that. That's the most granular, or at least in this instance, uh, one of the most granular ways to index. It can be quite complex. It can be expensive. I just like to typically recommend to my clients, you start with how you do it now, which is roll level. Use that for a bit. You can always do more like cutting hair. You can always cut more hair. You can't cut less once you do it. So if you start with how you do it now, just replicate that roll level searching, see if that works out. And then once you've used it for a bit, you can always come back with the existing digital image and say, all right, I thought it would work. It's okay. But now I want to go a little more detailed and I know exactly how we want to do this. It can prevent a lot of heartache and potentially wasted money if you try to be too fancy early and just doesn't work out well. All right. So what to consider when you're looking at a, a microfilm scanning project. If you're going with internal scanning. So I mentioned before we had the, like the scan pro, maybe you are buying a, a big machine. That's fine too. We've had uh, folks that have contacted us asking how we would do that, or, you know, is that an option where they may, even if they're scanning, doing the physical scanning, we're doing the post-processing. Yeah, that's an option too. But for internal scanning, do you have those available resources? Cause I've heard many times, well, it'll, you know, the, this machine is so-and-so thousand dollars, but if I do it, you know, I could just buy this machine and do it myself, or I could pay you, let's say it's an $8,000 machine, or I could pay you $20,000 for my project. Well, it's cheaper to use to just buy the machine myself. Maybe because that upfront cost looks and sounds cheaper, but then you actually have to do the work and you need to have the available resources. Who's going to do it? Is it you? Do you have all the time in the world to do it? Do you have uh, employees or staff that will help? Do you have machines? Okay, if you have one scanner, you can only scan one roll at a time. How many rolls do you have? How many do you need to get done? What's your timeline? Do you have the systems and software in place that once you actually do the scanning, then what? Then what do you do with the images? Do you, do you have an, a way to uh, adjust them, enhance them, to store them just to access after the fact? Where are they going to go? And then the expertise in digitization itself, because with the, the desktop scanners, they're pretty straightforward. If you're looking for a production scanner, you need to have not just the machine, but all the backend systems that can support that. And there's the maintenance as well. If something goes wrong with one of your scanners or your single scanner, what are you going to do? Now your project stalled, you have to send it somewhere, have a maintenance team or a person come out. All those things are costs. It just doesn't seem like it in the beginning. So think about that if you are going to do internal scanning. If you're outsourcing, such as to us, of course, what's the cost? That's always important. It may not be the make or break, but you can't just be, you don't want to burn money for the heck of it. 
the security of your records. I mentioned before, if you have sensitive records, absolutely look deeply into that. Do they have, do they get audits? Do they have certifications? What uh, best practices or what guidelines and you know, federal or, uh, regulations do they follow? An example would be, are they HIPAA compliant? These are medical records. That's absolutely critical. If they you work with student records, FERPA compliant, things of that sort. And then at the end of the day, everything can align. But if you don't have that warm and fuzzy gut feeling, just consider that. That's something to be aware of because you know gut instinct is important. It could sound right. It could seem like, hey, but if you go, I just don't know. There's something weird about this. Just research it more. Make sure you're not jumping into it. Because a lot of times with uh, microfilm records, you're probably, you only want to do this once. You don't want to do the project and then have to do it again because you missed something or you went too quickly or didn't look into it enough. You're only going to do this once to so do it right the first time so you don't have to do it again. So make sure, it sounds weird, but that warm and fuzzy factor is critical for these projects. All right. So that wraps up the process, the 10-step process for BMI, for us to do that. Again, any company you work with, we absolutely recommend looking at other folks and seeing how they do the work. But this is how we do our microfilm scanning project for our clients. So I'll see if there are any questions that while I was talking popped up or if there's anything right now. I don't see any sitting in the bucket right now. But if you have any, as I wrap this up, put them in there. I'll try to catch it before we end. Okay, uh, there's one. All right, this one, how do you determine cost? That is actually, uh, I believe, did a webinar on that maybe two or three months ago, but um, it, it's on our YouTube playlist. So if you want to see the full webinar, there's actually, we have a blog about it, we have a video about it, we have a webinar about it, but there are nine factors that go into it. The two, I won't go into all of them, but the two most important for cost are typically how many roles do you have and how do you want to do the indexing? So there's a, other other things that tie into that, but those are the two, the, the simplest way to say, you know, if you email me, said, hey, I have a microphone project and I email back saying, great, just to get started, how many do you have and how do you want them indexed? So those are very good indicators of what the cost will be because quantity, of course, is important. If you have 5,000 rolls, that's gonna be a much different price than if you had, 50 rolls. Now the unit price may go down. So the more you have, typically the unit price comes down. So 5,000 rolls, that price per roll will be much lower than the 50 roll price. But of course the project as a whole will be larger. It's just different uh, scenarios. And then indexing, is it roll level? Is it file level? Or how many fields are we capturing? If we're capturing multiple fields on a file, are they consistent in the same place? Where I'd find, are they sensitive records? Can I can I subcontract these? All these tie into that cost. Um, just thinking of another one that, I mean, those are the, the two kind of high level ones that are very quick to give me an idea of the scope. But then there are other things such as what's your timeline? What's the final system you want? Are you gonna use digital real, our application, or are you putting into one of your systems that we need to help get that imported? Things of that sort. So numerous factors that tie into that. But if you're interested, um, yeah, our blog has an article about that, but on our videos, uh, you can also see an entire webinar on that as well. Or if you're interested, you can also send me an email. We can chat about your project. That's fine to get specific for your pro project, that is. And then how can the digital copies be accessed? So if we are delivering what we call the traditional method, which would be PDFs, TIFFs, JPEGs, things like that, we would most likely do the project, load them to a USB drive and then send them to you. And then you could just access them as the files are. If you wanna load them to a system, that's you know up to you. The other option is our digital real application, which probably about 95% of our customers use the hosted version. And that is something that is a you know an annual subscription in most cases, sometimes it's monthly, but most, most of our clients is an annual subscription. So if we're doing your project, we scan your microfilm, and then as the roll, let's say it's a 500 roll project, as each roll is completed, as you saw in that process flow, you don't have to wait till the very end to receive them. They just get loaded immediately to our application where you can securely log in and access your, your records immediately. And then within that application, you have the ability to adjust and enhance images, you know, brightness, contrast, 
flipping polarity, things like that. You have the ability for global text search. As I like to say, you don't need to know where something is, just what it is. So you just, kind of like a Google search, you start typing and hits will come up of where those phrases, words, numbers, wherever they are, where those land. And then you, of course, have its uh, backup disaster recovery. You may not want it as your primary application. It could be maybe an augment or a backup system. And it's also co-located. Uh, co so we have two sites. So if there's a disaster at one of them, your records are still available at the other one. So it's a nice application. If you don't have a system to load your files to, it's something to look into. Even if you do have an application, because of the ability of that adjusting of images, especially with microfilm, because some microfilm can be pretty bad, that is something to consider for a backup. You know, if you have questions about that, uh, or you're looking for more information, there's a ton of stuff on our website, on our YouTube channel, et cetera, et cetera. Or you can just email me and I will answer this for you. Good questions though. Uh, no more questions. No, there's one more. Could a library patron access this remotely on the internet? Yes, and a lot of our clients do that. So we are not a legal team. We don't give legal advice. So that goes into copyright and you know what your specific library or organization can do. But in the case of a library, uh, some of our clients have all their records available to the public. So an example, a very familiar name is Napa County Library, you know, wine country. If you go to their website, you can access their entire database of it's like 1500 rules or something uh, through their website. They talked to the, the publisher. Publisher said, sure, put it out there and it's out there. Other um, clients, uh, one of mine, which is Sunnyvale Public Library, they have all records prior to 1964 available any, from anywhere. So I could log in from here or not log in, but I could access it from here. But anything from 19 or after 1964 is only accessible from within the library. So their legal team uh, determined that they wanted to split those based on copyright and how they were uh, reading about their records or interpreting their, their records. Some's available everywhere and some can only be accessed from within the physical location of the library. So depending on how you set up, yes, your patrons can access that. And that's one of the reasons many libraries work with us because it just makes it so much easier for uh, their patrons to use, to access the records. It's still familiar like microfilm, especially in digital reels, what I'm referring to. Uh, but it has that, you know, it's still digital technology. It's still, we're continually updating, improving it. So new generations just go, okay, it's an application. I'll go find the records. Okie dokie, those are the last questions. So again, send me an email if you're interested in chatting. Uh, if you're not already signed up, you can just pop up your cell phone, pull up your camera, and then when you see, you know, hover over that and then click the, uh, the little link thing that pops up and it'll take you to our newsletter science, put an email. Every other Tuesday, you get an email with any new webinars coming up, new articles, videos, things of that sort, anything important in digital imaging world, and it'll keep you updated. But appreciate you joining today. I hope you got some information and it's useful for you. And again, Happy New Year. And thank you for doing this as the first, uh, probably the first webinar of the year for you. So have a nice day and thank you again.